This episode of the Get Fast podcast is brought to you by Trivolo Coaching, where we help triathletes and cyclists like you train smarter to race faster. You are joined, as always, by your hosts, Australian Ironman champion, Jared Donnelly, and I am Jordan Donnelly. So today we're talking about bike training techniques that will help you ride faster. The key things you need to be doing in training to help you go faster out on the road because a lot of people forget that the whole point of training is to ride faster and it's safe to say that here at Trivelo we are data obsessed, we love power, we love FTP, however the reason we love it is so that we can use it to go faster on our bike and sometimes athletes forget that. So today we're going to be talking about all how to translate some training techniques for on the bike to help you go faster in a race. But firstly, as usual, What's caught your attention, Dad, the last couple of weeks? There's so many things. I was really struggling to come up with with uh, one that um, uh, I wanted to talk about today, but I, I really narrowed it down. Um, Struggled because there were so many. Right? Too many, yeah. yeah. Um, and I wanted to prioritise the importance, I think, um, and really the racing on the weekend uh, in the triathlon scene in Victoria. They had their first set of races for – nearly a year so so that obviously that caught my attention with the performances of our athletes which was you know, from our point of view outstanding but but <coughs> on that point making judgments about your performance um without having the right information that's kind of the the thing that's really i really want to make sure people before they want to you know, sell their bike on eBay or <laughs> or throw their runners in the bin or burn their goggles. Um, uh, you've just got to take a, a moment to really look at um, every piece of information so that you're making a decision about your performance based on accurate data. So what do I mean by that? Mm-hmm. Well, the example would be one of our athletes who happened to do a time trial outdoors and he's you know, been a member of our squad for a a long period of time and we've got lots of data on his performances over the journey and over a two and a bit year period, um, he's progressed from 34 k's an hour to 36 to 38 on the weekend. His power has progressed from 220, 240, 260, 270. On the last week during his time trial, his power was down. Um, and that was the focus that he he just could not get past, and he had ridden the fastest average speed that he'd ever ridden in two and a half years mm. by half a kilometre mm. an hour. It was pretty significant. Yeah. So trying to explain to him that that's that's the best result you've ever done. Yeah. Um, was interesting, and and making sure that he could clearly see the reasons why I said that and but what about my power you know my power is down well the choice is are you happy to do a pb with 80 watts or you're happy to do your fourth best with 300 watts Mm. obviously I'll take 80 watts I don't care what the watt number is as long as so that's the point I'm making it's you know you've got to understand uh, what is important yeah Um, what are the what are the most important things you're trying to achieve here we want to go from a to b Faster than we did before. Yeah. That's what we're training for. Yeah. That's that's the whole purpose of practice. Um, and you're going to talk about that <laughs> in your, what's caught your attention. But but that's that's really what I'm trying to get across in in this significant point that I'm making is don't be quick to judge yourself until you have all the information, and you can make poor decisions post event about how well you went and can be quite depressing and low you lose confidence and and the example i just gave that that person had lost total confidence in his training his program his performance i'm going backwards well no you're not that's the best you've ever done so let's just stop there and think about that for five seconds before we now make our next judgment call about how to progress from here well what happened with the power meter Something happened. Mm. Was it calibrated? Yeah, we go and investigate why the power was down. Um, In that effort, because the power meter wasn't working properly, he actually executed terribly. He rode 
276 two, for the first five minutes, 270, 265, 253. And he still did a PB. Mm. Imagine if the power meter was working properly and he rode how he's meant to ride, which is holding your every five minutes holding and progressively improving, yeah. um, he would have actually ridden faster yeah. had he executed better. So, so you know, how's my form? Your form's unbelievably brilliant. It's the best it's ever been yeah. from I don't want to ride anymore. Yeah. That they're the two extreme thoughts that he had. Yeah. So by the end of the conversation, I'm saying to him, now how do you feel? He goes, well, I feel pretty damn good about that if that's the fastest i've ever ridden whereas before i wanted to sell my bike on ebay (laughs) um so so the point is there you know find out more data make a a better base decision i guess that's your role as a coach as well is to help with that analysis because it's not always clear to the athlete Uh, but you just you're just making the point that you want athletes to not make a snap judgment and wait till you get all the data and you can make a proper level-headed assessment exactly and there was another example as well from um uh, comparing uh, someone just was looking to compare times on the weekend to their last race and you really pointed out a pretty key factor that would stop them from making a poor snap judgment. Yes, and <clears throat> one of our athletes was saying, right, for, I've done Olympic distance uh, triathlon many times and my best 10K off the bike in this race is 38 minutes 20, which is pretty damn good running. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not the point we're trying to make here. The point that, that she was making was... I would hope to run that time in this race. And and I said, well, was that a full 10K in that last event? And, well, it turns out that it was 9.6. So Because races aren't <coughs> always exact with their distances. They're not 10K to the, you know. Sometimes they, they're more, sometimes they're less. It could be 10.1, it could be 9.8, it could be 9.6, it could be 10.4. So it's near impossible, you know, to get the swim distance right, yeah. to get the bike, you know. 40k it's going to be 39 or 38 or 42 or 41 it's not going to be 40 exactly so so comparing your time is a mistake you need to be comparing for the 10k your average speed that you were running at the average pace Mm. so what the question i asked was what was your average pace in that 38 minute 10k 356 or 352 whatever it was um I said, okay, if if you run a 41 and you run 349 uh, pace, she's going, hey, well, how's that possible? It could, be, it could be 10.8K. Or that's something. right. Yeah. That's how it could be possible. Yeah. Um, which one are you going to be happy with, the 38-minute result or the 41-minute result? Clearly, you've run a 349 compared to a 355. Yeah. So you're going to be happy with the 41-minute yeah. result. So looking for the right, uh, you know, uh, Data is is you know you, you can't go by time yeah. in an event that's not it's not a four hundred meter track and a, and it's not a fifty meter sp- swim yeah. event yeah. they are undisputable facts yeah. it's fifty meters and some pools have been forty nine point five not many ass tracks have been three hundred and ninety eight but yeah. but the point is on an ass track you know that that's a variable you you can guarantee that's going to be the same but in a triathlon. There is no, there is no course, that, and of course, then you can't. I'm saying you can't compare this Olympic distance where there was 300 meters of altitude uh, elevation in the ride, mm-hmm. and this one's pancake flat. Mm-hmm. They're both Olympic Olympic distances, but you're comparing apples with oranges. Yep. Um, so you, you, you need to be, you know, if I've done Noosa try five times, that's a race I can compare. Yep. But you still would have conditions like temperature, wind, yep. um, that would affect that. Yeah. So, so she was looking for the right thing, but you've just got to be careful not to say, well, I'm only a success if I run 38.20 again because that's that yeah. wouldn't have helped. Yep. So my summary to her was, you know, in the swim, what's your, what's your per 100 metre pace you swam at? You know, you might it might have been a 1,500 and you swam 1,750 because you ran, swam diff, crooked, mm. but your average pace was 144 and previous it was 148. Yet my time was two minutes slower. Well, we can fix your, your swim direction. Mm. But your swimming pace has improved, so that's a, that's a plus, you know. Yep. Yep. For the bike, you look at power, but you look at average speed. Mm-hmm. The power is a techni- technical um, issue that could could be inaccurate. That's what was the previous example. But the average speed is something that's pretty much guaranteed. Yep. And as a runner, you're looking for the average pace. So yep. they're the three things that we want to concentrate in a triathlon. Yeah. 
really, really good points. And I had a, I experienced a similar kind of test mentally myself. Um, and this is <laughs> this is what I wanted to touch on. Uh, I had a pretty interesting interesting experience. It's last gutsy week. that you want to talk about this, George. Yeah. I'm very impressed. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I don't always enjoy talking about this. This <laughs> stuff is personal, but. Um, Basically, for the listeners to know, I, I've always had a goal since I was a teenager, to be honest, to break two minutes for the 800. A lot of my running friends did it when we were growing up and I just could never do it. I was, um, I was quite small back then and I just didn't have the power to break mm. two minutes. And since then, it's been a goal. And every few years, I, I think I've kind of had a crack at it and um, not probably serious enough until about three years ago, I said, right, I'm going to knuckle down during the summer season and have a proper crack at an 800 because it's a very specific distance to train Let's for. Let's put this in context. You're 18, 19, trying to break eight, uh, two minutes for 800. Yeah. You're now 28, so yeah. it's not a few years. It's yeah. been a 10-year <laughs> ambition it is, yeah. with two to three years of actually trying properly. Yeah, yeah. I don't like admitting it to people because I go, I've had this goal for 10 years. It's eluded <laughs> me for so long. And um, But the last few track seasons, I've, I've had a serious crack and I've ran two minutes flat. I don't know how many times now. Six or five. Yeah, it's five or six times. So under 201, yeah. five times. Yeah, and two, 2.4. And for 2. the 6. listeners, <laughs> that's basically between me and Jordan in distance across the table. Yeah. And you just think to yourself, why can't I just get an extra metre faster, you know, and, and every race is slightly different. Um, but I had a really good training year last year in the lead up to the track season um, for a lot of other years. My base was probably missing. I probably had the speed, but not the base. And this year it was the opposite. I had way more base and... Um, now I just have to try and fix the speed and came into it at the first race of the season last Thursday night and we had a pretty specific plan um, to give it a red hot crack and I was mentally I psyched myself up probably more than I ever have because I just said I'm sick of I'm so sick of this I am just ready to break it um, and I'm just I wrote a note on my hand um, to remind myself um, as I was warming up as I was getting ready to race even when I checked my watch at the 200 mark to um, really mentally go and um, we ran the race and I ran 200.05 and I mean I ran 2.4 or 2.6 but 0.05 is the smallest gap I've ever had to, mm. to not breaking two minutes. We're talking under under a second so so two minutes and one second we're not talking about that we're talking about two minutes no zero, seconds zero zero, zero yeah. point zero five. Point zero five hundredths of a second yeah. And I, when I crossed... That's fault, a PB, George. It was a PB, yes. <laughs> by <laughs> by 0.3 of a second. Um, when I crossed the line, I thought I had it. And um, I was I was really not in a good way afterwards. I really pushed myself. Um, and then I spoke to you maybe five minutes later on the phone. And I, I could barely talk, to be honest, at the time. And you said, I think you got it. Yeah. So I, I took a screenshot. It's a, it, at the Milers Club is, is uh, filmed. Yeah. And I froze the film with Jordan crossing the line and the time on the screen is there saying 159.6 yeah. and Jordan's over the line. Yeah. So I sent you that saying you did it. Yeah. And what? I said, I said, I think I did it as well, but I'm going to wait for the official results. But um, and the official results came out. Yeah. And I was pretty happy and I thought, um, but I'm still, I'm not going to celebrate properly until the official results come out because uh, you have to go off the official results and a few minutes later, they come out five minutes later or something. I was just sitting there anxiously waiting and they came out and I looked at them and I just, um, I almost cried to be honest. Mm. And I just, I looked at the time and I just thought, you gotta be fucking kidding me. <laughs> 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 I thought someone was playing a cruel joke and I stared at it and I actually refreshed it to think maybe mm. they'd made a mistake or something, which it was a feeble attempt. And it was a pretty dark five minutes to be honest. I just, I literally just said, I give up. I'm not doing it again. Um, uh, yeah, I just said, I'm fucking, I'm, just, I'm not training anymore for it. Um, I said, I'm going to do something else. I'm not even going to train anymore. You know, I was really, I was mm. really quite negative, which mm. um, you can expect the reaction. I've never had that, that big of a negative reaction before. I was just so angry. Um, and then I gathered myself and um, I put my, put my shoes on and trudged out to do a warm down and I was just cursing the whole warm down and I was just so angry at, at everything. <laughs> And uh, funnily enough, you know, I, I ran for five or ten minutes, and by the end, I had a little fleeting thought, and I just thought, oh, maybe I'll go again. Um, and I went, no, nah, I'm, I'm sick of it. Um, and it was, it was quite a, quite a dark half an hour. And I think as athletes, um, I call anyone that puts a number on or anyone that um, goes into a race um, an athlete. Um, some people like to not call themselves athletes unless they're, unless they're pros, but 
uh, I think all cyclists and triathletes are athletes and as athletes you you have highs and lows um, you experience these things in a range of forms throughout uh, races that you're doing and training sessions and um, for me this was one of the one of the lowest ones and um, just at the time it just means everything and then mm. um, in this grand scheme of things it doesn't it doesn't mean anything but just the amount of effort you've put in the amount of times you've had a, you've had a go I got in the car and I was just still I was just still um, in that headspace of um, I'm done and then after about 10 or 15 minutes of driving something flicked again and I just said when I'm not done um, I'm going again the next race is in a month um, and you just need that little bit of time to settle and reset and get the emotional charge out of it um, mm. out of your thought process and um, suddenly I was as motivated as ever to to go again and I think I texted you by the time I got home and said, fuck it, I'm going again. And mm. um, and you just feel more motivated to put in it, put your head down and put an even harder month in and um, see if you can shave off 0.05 of a second. <laughs> yeah, it's an unbelievably good story and it's a shocking feeling that you've had and almost everybody who's listening has set themselves targets and goals and, and underachieved. Um, and you've got so many options available to you and... It's a real strength of character. Um, you know, we've used the example of Daniel Byrne, and he doesn't mind me using his name, but he took three years to break his three-hour marathon. And he ran under 3.01 twice within a minute. Mm. And finally he ran three, 2.59, mm. just under, under one minute, under yeah. three hours. Yeah. And the difference in feeling with – literally 50 seconds either side was euphoric yeah yeah compared to depressed yeah um but it, it took it took a lot to get there uh, he was a 320 mar- marathon runner so it was an amazing effort anyway yeah um but the reward when you do it and when you do do this which will be you know it will happen um there's so many positive things that have come out of of what you just did because it was your first run for a year you know you talk about horse races you know first run it's it's their crappiest run and they're better for the run and they'll do better next time you had a race plan and you executed the race plan unbelievably well exactly what we planned you to do we you did except you just ran short out of legs at mm. the end and that's probably from race practice race fitness and we spoke about that the fact that when you have a plan and you execute the plan as well as you could, you are actually a little bit less disappointed with the result. And yep. that was what I took solace in a bit later, a couple of hours later, that you know, yep. the process was correct. It's just that end result wasn't there. So actually happy with the process, not happy with the result, but that's okay. Yeah. And and just to believe that, you know, we did talk about this last week's podcast where there's going to be challenges thrown at you. And um, unfortunately, those challenges have been thrown at you every time you've done it. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, I just remember Daniel just having the same conversation with him about, you know, are we going to go again? But I, he, you need, the athlete needs time to want to do it themselves. I, I'm not going to sit here and say, come on, George, you can do it. That's yeah. not my decision. Yeah. You you have to come to me and go, no, nah, I'm doing that. Yeah. And I'll go, awesome, let's do it. Yeah. Um, and, but you have to make, the, you have to have time to, to absorb. And it's almost like what, what I talked about in what's caught my attention was, yeah. You know, um, sure, your your data that you got, we can't change. Whereas what I was talking about was looking for the right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is, you know, this is uh, a challenge that's thrown at you and, and you're up for it, which I I just love that. You know, the more, the more you challenge, the more you're going to, I'm not giving up. Um, and, you know, I don't care how long this takes me, I'm going to do this. And, and that's when you've got that mental approach, you will do it. Um, I've got a few guys who I just trust their judgment and you know one of them and he said oh next time no worries and you've got text messages from lots of people you know we interviewed Geordie Williams who's a, a, an Olympian as- aspirant saying no worries next time you'll smash it yeah. you know and that that's a good it's feeling encouraging yeah, yeah. yeah to have that around but you've still got to, you've still got to do the work yeah. and you've still got to you know it's not going to happen you've still got to go through the process and I, I hated saying this to myself, but I did say to myself, well, look, you couldn't, you did as well as you could, but um, I did have a very relaxed month leading into it. You know, mm. come, I had a big training year. And so come mid-December, I took my um, foot off the pedal. Yep. Um, 
and I yeah had a very relaxed month of training. Um, it was very cruisy, not much intensity, um, and yep. so going into it, I wasn't quite in form anyway. And I yeah, well, you had that. one week of track training, <laughs> yeah, which you know yeah. I, I was even knowing and hiring to say, well, you know, yeah. you could do it for practice because you're not going to do it on your first <laughs> yeah your yeah. first attempt. But you nearly did it yeah. with the first attempt, and shows you with a bit more focus that you know we we will hopefully would be reporting in one month's time that you have cracked this elusive. 159. So that's the story. We'll move on with the, uh, with the podcast. So today's topic uh, is talking about pretty much these, these kind of conversations is um, training techniques to, to go faster and what to actually pay attention to, what's going to actually help you go faster. So one of the starting points is that when you teach athletes about power, uh, sometimes they be- can become too power focused and they actually forget to race. You know, they forget to try and go fast. And that's a common issue. There's been a lot of examples where I've uh, spoken to some athletes prior to an event and we've got our race plan, our power, our if we're talking about cycling time trial, yeah. if we're talking about triathlon, we've got our swim, we've got our ride and we've got our run strategies. And at the end I'll say it's really important that you have all this information available to you the whole way through so you can make better decisions but don't forget to race. <laughs> That's actually what you're there for. You've actually got to race. So use use the technology to assist you to get to a point where you can then be free as a bird to, to go for it, to race. Yeah. There's an example, which is a different example that, um, that you probably haven't heard before, but um, the first year that one of our guys won the national time trial titles, um, and that was one of the things I said to him just prior to the race was, you know, get to a point where – you're comfortable with you haven't blown up by going too hard because this was a downhill start and I, I think I said to him you know if your power in the first five minutes is hard, faster than or higher than your last five minutes I'm going to hit you over the head with a cricket bat yeah, yeah yeah anyway get to these points without blowing up and then race mm. and he came back after the race going that's exactly the race strategy that I did. Once I knew that I wasn't going to blow up and that I, I could risk more, I actually I didn't care about the power. And I've said that to many people. Say you're trying to ride 330 watts or 230 watts. It doesn't matter what the number is. Yeah. You know, you, you're in a race. Mm. Once you've got it under control and there's you know three quarters of the race done or, or half the race done, let loose yeah. and ride the power that you can you know, that's yeah. new PB. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And, and see how high you can push it. Yeah. You know, that's that's how you race. Yeah, and, exactly. and don't even worry about the power. Just yeah. there's a guy up the head, I'm going to catch him. Yeah. And in a time trial, everybody's spaced out by a minute apart or 30 seconds apart. That's when you stop looking at the, the data and start looking at the, the race. And right, he's my target. Use that as your incentive. Mm, absolutely. And you had another example on the weekend. And I think we probably <laughs> said – a different example of this, um, maybe five or six times on the podcast of, uh, and you even just gave one at the very start, but we had a, an, another different person on the weekend um, or last week. Yep. Execute an FTP test, only use power, not have average speed, um, think they did poorly. and um, Yep. Yeah. And without naming names, it's probably the same, <laughs> some of this ex- exactly the same person. Um, so... You know, going into an FTP test, you know, we're banging on about power all the time. We are a very power-driven coaching business. You know, it is such an important analysis tool to, to, to be using to make your ride faster. And we use heart rate. We use average speed. We use cadence, um, you know, and we use power. So they're the things that you should be looking at, all of those things, not just one. And... And that's something that uh, he actually learnt from, and he's been doing this for a long time, yeah. and he is the national time trial champion. Yeah. And to make that mistake in a training FTP test w- was really good because it, he actually learned something. Um, and, it, and it's only because I've experienced the same problem myself where all of a sudden the power meter is not working properly, but you don't know that. You just think it's you. Mm. Um, so instead of riding at 330 watts, you're busting your guts at 310 and you can't ca- hold it. And you're progressively doing 310 for five minutes, 300, 290, 270. And that's what happened. Mm. And, you know, text message, 
I don't know what's wrong with me. That was shit. Mm. You know, just really disappointment. Just you know, like you experienced in the eight hundred. But but it wasn't because of performance. It was because of the information from technology was incorrect. Mm. So therefore, you're getting false information. So we need backups. And and the example is. If you had average speed on your screen and you were doing 310 watts and you're normally, you, you, when you finish that event, you normally ride at 44 k's an hour. And if you see that you're doing 310 watts and you're on the velodrome and you're doing 46 k's an hour, instantly you know the power meter's wrong. Mm. So then you would go, okay, I'll switch my attention and I'll just go by average speed. And that's, that's having a backup. And, in, and if you were really concentrating, his heart rate was at threshold within two minutes, which meant that he was basically just yeah. riding 30 watts higher Ready to blow up. than he should have, yeah. even though the power meter was telling him he wasn't. Yeah. So, so that's an, another example of having more information at your – and it's there. Mm. You just choose not to, to do it. And, mm. and now he does have those <laughs> yeah. metrics on his screen. Yeah. Yeah. And he went out and redid it. After 200 k's on a Saturday, <laughs> did it on a Sunday and rode 46 k's an hour at 300 watts, 30 watts lower yeah. than what he had done previously. Yeah. You think he's going to be disappointed with that? Not yeah, anymore because he knows now that that's the fastest he's ever ridden. Yeah, yeah. after 200 k's as well. And I will say that something that's caught my attention, something else that's caught my attention is the absurdity of some of the Travelo bunch rides on Sundays, they just keep blowing out. I mean, they used to blow out to 150, 160, then a couple of guys would do, including yourself, would do 180, and then there's a few guys doing 200 on last it, weekend, which it, is... It was open to them to do as long <laughs> as they want. Yep, and they, they really took that, that that bull by the horns. So uh, I guess the main point here is uh, we have to remember that speed is the end goal, um, but you don't focus on speed to get faster. <coughs> Speed's the end goal, but that's not part of the process. The process is to focus on power, focus on your execution, focus on those other factors. Yeah, uh, look, you've, a way to look at it is um, input and output. Okay, so what what does that mean? Well, what what do you have to do to get fast faster from A to B? Because that's that's what we, we line up because we want to we want to get there as fast than ever we've done before. So we have to use something. So it's effort. So we measure the effort. So that's the input. So we're measuring it with a power meter on a bike. As a runner, we're measuring it with average pace. As a swimmer, we're measuring it with average speed per 100 meters. So that's what we're measuring. That's the input. What's the result of that? Well, you get an average speed as a result of the effort you do. Heart rate is an output. So average speed's an output. Heart rate's an output. Um, the distance you travel is an output. They're, they're not the things that, that cause the result, mm -hmm. the effort is what causes the output. Mm -hmm. So the harder you pedal at, the higher the heart rate goes. Yeah. The easier you pedal, the easier the heart rate is. Yeah. So input, output. Yeah. We need to concentrate on the input, not on the output. The output is the result of our effort. Yeah. And I think unless you can understand that concept, you're not on the same train as, as what I'm talking about. Yeah. And a good example or metaphor you use is the example of a football player. Yeah. So as a full forward, my goal is to kick as many goals as I can each week. That's my job. So do I concentrate on how many goals can I kick the whole match? How many goals can I kick? How many goals? I've got, I've got to kick a goal. I've got to kick a goal. And if I think like that all day, instead of leading, taking a mark, going back and then kicking a goal, I forgot what got me the goal. I have to lead. I have to run and chase the ball. I have to go and tackle someone. I have to do some effort to get the opportunity to kick the goal. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that helps or not, but... Same thing, input versus output. Input versus output. So un unless you're willing to put the effort in, the result's not going to change. Yeah, but we want to make sure that people are um, willing to look at the input but also look at the output that's happening and measure it against each other. And I guess that's what we want to get into now. So let's yep. get into some of the top training techniques that you can use to actually practice this to <coughs> be able to get faster. And there's three main uh, things we want to talk about. And the first one, a uh, top training technique, is in terms of your input, concentrate on the pedaling technique. Yeah, let's just get this straight. We're trying to learn how to go faster. 
what are, what are some tips, what are some secrets that are going to make you be able to ride or run or swim faster? So let's talk about the bike. If you have in your pedaling action areas where there's no pressure on the pedals in that, you know, let's, let's think about it. It's 360 degrees from when you start at the top of the pedaling action all the way down to the bottom and bring it all the way back up to the top. That's 360. It's one revolution. If you've got gaps in pressure, then you've got wasted energy for that one pedal action. So you imagine you multiply that because we do 90 of those pedal actions per minute. Mm. How many gaps are you having? We talked about heart rate last week about um, two weeks ago on our podcast about how many times your heart beats Mm. over a lifetime. Mm. But, you know, if you've got gaps in your pedaling action where there's no pressure on the pedals, you've wasted that that one pedal action to get 90% value or some people are only getting, because we all grew up with no toe clips, so yeah. we all push down. Yeah. So we're actually only getting 50% of our value for every pedal action. Yeah. So what we need to do is understand that this will be a game changer. If you can keep pressure on your pedals and concentrate on that in your race, one of the things you need to think about the whole race, am I giving constant pressure throughout the whole pedaling action? And, you know, once I've known this so many times, if I start to think about pull up, Jared, in the action, all of a sudden I look down and I'm doing 280 watts with, with three pedal revolutions of pulling up, I'm now at 295. Instantly I get an increase in power and guess what? That means I'm going faster because if I increase my power, my speed goes up. So it's just a no-brainer. Think about things that are going to make you improve your speed and that's one of them, is pedalling fully with pressure on the pedals, the whole revolution. And that seems so simple, but try it. Mm. It is so difficult to do. And we're talking a 30-minute race, a one-hour race, and in an Ironman we're talking doing that for five or six hours. You will be up to 15 minutes faster if you can keep the pressure on the pedals evenly throughout the, every pedal revolution that you do throughout that whole five hours or six hours. Um, and you're not wasting energy with extra pedaling. You know, you have to, you have to pedal a lot more to mm. get the same power. And you're just constantly reminding yourself that about you in every time trial. Yeah, there's, you know, we're going to get to that at the end, but there's, there's some things that I am talk, I'm talking to myself throughout the race about the things I need to be thinking about. And it's not... How far to go? Yeah. Or how am I feeling? Yeah. They're kind of in the background. Yeah. And this is why we're calling them top training <laughs> techniques because uh, this is stuff you have to practice in training. You you can't just do it in a race because you, you won't have the uh, – your body won't be able to. Well, you're not drilled in it for a start. So every training session, I'm forever trying to think about my pedaling. Mm. Um, and, and it, it you know, if I'm chatting to someone, I notice that my power's dropped, my RP revs per minute have dropped – and the intensity's dropped because I've, you know, I'm just talking to someone. Yeah. You know, it's very hard and you end up, you know, my wife asked me, what did you talk about on the ride today? Yeah, I thought about my pedaling technique <laughs> for the whole ride and yeah. very le- rarely did I say anything yeah. to anybody. But, yeah. but you know, on the easy rides, that's probably the time to practice, um, you know, really keeping the pressure on the pedals a lot. So if you're not doing it in training, if you're not doing it in the easy and in the very hard sessions – then it's not going to happen on race day. You're going to do it for 10 seconds and then five minutes later you're going, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got to pull up. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it has to be part of, your, part of your psyche in everything you're doing. Yeah. Point number two, and this is another concentrating one, uh, a technique that you need to practice in training, and that is concentrating on your position. Yeah. Um, there's just so many uh, studies that have been done, you know, from the extreme, the wind tunnel testing, to, you know, if, I, if I'm, you know, as a kid trying to ride faster, you know, you don't sit up like this trying to ride faster with your head, you know, touching the sky. You know, as a kid, you would tuck You're your head. You're learning. You, yeah. you tuck your head down because yeah. I think that makes me fa- go faster. I've got no evidence to yeah. base that on because I don't have a computer. Yeah. In 1970, there wasn't even, you know, I just had a bike. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, I knew that it went faster because – I felt it. Mm. So so the position can be, you know, without without buying a better bike, without training any harder, this is free speed. And that's we wanna we mm. wanna find things that are going to make us go faster. Mm. So 
So getting in a better aero position, as long as you can still push the power, which is the effort, yep. then you're going to go faster. So spend a lot of your time thinking about, am I in the right position? Mm. And the, one of the tricks I use is, is my chin aiming at the, the handlebars or is it up in the air? So the more I force my chin forward to the handlebars, the more tucked position I am in which means that I'm more aero, so therefore the bike's going to go faster, so therefore I'm going to get from A to B quicker mm. than anybody else. Yeah. If you're putting in all this effort for over 30 minutes, over an hour, over four hours, you don't want to be getting distracted and slowly getting out of position and slowing yourself down because you're, you're really putting in that effort in your legs and then your upper body is letting you down because you're not concentrating. Well, the biggest resistance on a bike is the wind. So the faster you go, the more slower the bike will want to go because you're actually hitting the wind you know at a greater velocity plus the natural speed of the wind whether it's a headwind or a tailwind but you create your own headwind by riding anyway people know that you you feel the wind in your face and you just by riding if if it's a still day there's still wind in your face you're creating it and the faster you go that doubles Mm. the resistance of 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 you know trying to slow you down so if you can hide and tuck into a little you know, really aerodynamic speed demon machine, you're, you're going to get free free speed. Yeah. So so I, I, you've got to practice this in training. Yeah. You know, talk about cadence. If you just expect to hold that position for an hour or five hours in a triathlon or 30-minute time trial, you're going to have trouble because your body's not used to it. You're going to fatigue um, and you're not going to ride that well because your body can't hold the position. So, you know... Strength and conditioning off the bike is going to teach you uh, practicing the aero in in your training, whether you're on the the trainer or at the velodrome. You know, try every time you do the effort. Right, my position. Yeah. I've got to hold it for this five minutes or eight minutes or whatever yeah. the session is. And then when you're doing the recovery, sit up and relax, and then back to the position. They're little tips that'll enable you to to come race day. It'll be natural. I'm yeah. now racing. Where's my position? Yeah. Basically, your aim is to you try to constantly remind yourself to reduce the drag as much as possible. Yeah. You're creating. So, point number three, and this will probably tie it all together, um, but you know, this is where you can be aiming for free speed is to always be assessing your your power numbers, um, but not just your power numbers, all your numbers, so all the data you have available in conjunction with each other. Yep, and and that's kind of a great summary to finish with because it's just not one thing. And the example we used of of uh, at the start of um, of people looking at only things in isolation. So this is the system that I use, and I'm repeating it throughout my time trial. Um, and if I was doing a, a swim in a triathlon, I'd be doing the same thing. If I was on the bike, if I was running, I'm doing different topics, obviously for different mm-hmm. sports. But on the bike, we're talking about today. What are the things that are going to make me go faster is repeating these key concepts in my head over and over as I'm riding. I'm not thinking about, you know, who's on the side watching me. I'm not thinking about, um, you know, the wind that much. I'm not thinking about how hot it is. I'm not thinking about how far to go. I'm just reminding myself, what is my power number? What is my cadence? What is my heart rate? What is my average speed? And there... The final thing is what's my position? Yep. So five things that are happening in my head over and over. And the minute I've stopped thinking about my power, because I'm thinking I'm up to the fifth one, my position, I'm back to power. And that might have taken 10 seconds to go through that. Mm. So I'm just referring to that the whole time. And once I've got on top of that and I've got the rhythm of the race, because time trialling is an individual sport, you are just focusing on what you're doing. It's not a tactical thing. Well, it is tactical with the, the strategy that you have, but you're not relying on other people around you. It's just you against the clock. So this is what we're talking about here. And if I've got those things under control, then I can start to race, which is what we started with. Mm-hmm. You know, Have these concepts as your main focus and then once I've got my rhythm going, I'm into my race halfway through, I'm happy with my cadence, I'm feeling strong in the legs, my heart rate's under control, my position's beautiful, my, my power number's exactly where it should be, the cadence is, you know, 
I'm, I've got a, a rise coming. I'm not going to grind up this hill. I'm going to change gears, make sure I keep the cadence in the 88, 90, 92 for me. Um, on the on the climb, the, the hill will keep the power up for me, so I've just got to not grind up here and not be at 75 or 70. And then over the top of the hill, I've then got to change gears again, so on the downhill, I can get into the biggest gear possible so they're not spinning, which is going to stimulate my heart rate. I don't want that to happen. So these are the things, and then I can start to say, right, who's ahead of me? Mm. How far away are they? Can I, can I catch them? Yeah. So I'm doing all these things to get me to... to understand the data and then race i was going to say before the wind is probably a bad example before because you will pay attention to yes. the wind but secondary to these five yes. things you'll be asking these five things constantly and then the external factors like the hill coming up uphill downhill the yep. terrain the wind uh, that comes after when all these things are just constantly under control that's right and look definitely the terrain and the wind as a time trialist is so key because if you're into a headwind, you need to be riding fractionally above threshold. If you're in a tailwind, it's okay to be under threshold because basically you can't ride 70 k's an hour to keep the pressure of the power on, on the pedals. So That's a really big point. So when we teach power to athletes, it, uh, it's quite overwhelming and confusing at first and it takes people a while to get used to focusing on power. And so we can't ask athletes to just focus on all of this at once because it's just not going to be possible. But there has to be a point where you get used to power and then refocus on all these things because if you don't, you're going to be riding uphill, downhill, into wind, into tailwind, trying to just hold that one power number and it's not going to be happening for you. You're going to actually ride quite horribly. Yeah, there's so much more details that we haven't gone into with how to ride power, but mm. we're talking about today how to get faster. Yeah. Um, yep. so, so at the end of the day, you know, the things you just spoke about, you know, what should my power be on the uphill into a headwind? What should it be on downhill? What should it be on the flat um, tailwind? You know, they're all things and cadence changes according to the terrain yeah. they're all things that are next level you know and the athletes that we have they all know that yeah i guess it summarizes this last point is that if you want to go faster um it is about power but it is about power in conjunction with all these things you're saying it's about power in conjunction to what's your heart rate doing power in conjunction to your cadence power in conjunction to your average speed and you've got to be looking at all those things to make sure that the end result is a higher average yeah speed. so if all those things are are uh, aligned mm-hmm. you will do a pb yeah. if you've got the right power the right position the right cadence the right heart rate the average speed is the result of that and your average speed will go up that's a pretty perfect way to summarize i think this this whole thing i, I guess the main take-home message is that um remember to the goal is to ride faster so um, you want power to be your friend you want power to be some a piece of data that helps you um, and you want to learn how to use it well, but um, it is not the sole thing that's going to get you to ride faster, um, and it's not the sole goal of your effort, whether it's in training or racing. Your goal isn't actually higher power. Higher power will normally make you go faster, but as we've spoken about, um, power is a piece of data that can actually go wrong, and so in the cases where it goes wrong, uh, you need to know how to focus on the things that are going to get your average speed up. Yeah, but look, if you come home and the family ask you, how did you go today? They're not going to ask you what your power was. Yeah. They're going to go, did you do a PB? Yeah. Uh, and if you're used to being a podium athlete, did you win? Mm. And if you're used to being a, an age grouper who's in it for the love of it and wanting to improve, did you do a PB? They're the, they're the two questions. It's not going to be... Was your power up? Yeah. That, not many people are going to want to know that. And that, that's what the point is here is, yeah. you know, it, these are the things we use to get the result. Yeah. So in training, if you can take these tips, if you can practice focusing on these things, then I think the perfect term you use is it's free speed for you. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yes. Um, the, these are gold little, um, as you say, hacks yeah. that, will, uh, that will enable you to, to be a better rider. Perfect. Well, that's it for this episode. Thanks very much for listening and we'll see you next time.